So let's get started. Uh, so last time we talked about, we talked about multiplicative weights and zero-sum games. So who can give me a quick rundown of what we covered last time? So what are the main takeaways from the last lecture we covered? You can hedge using multiplicative weights. Very yes. Well. Uh, you can hedge using multiplicative weights, exactly. So uh, keep in mind the goal for multiplicative weights was what we want to be able to do is we want to compete with the best expert. The best expert in hindsight. So we know very little about what these distributions of losses are. But even in spite of the fact that these aren't stochastically generated vectors, they're really things that happen online. We still want to ensure that our loss is additively close to the loss of the best expert, which we don't know in advance. So that was the setting for multiplicative waves. And can anyone remind me how we applied it to zero sum games? So, what did we use multiplicative weights to do once we had the existence of these good regret guarantees? Find the strategies, exactly. So what we studied was when we first studied zero-sum games, back when we were talking about LPs and LP duality, one of our first applications of LP duality was the von Neumann's min-max theorem, which tells you that there are three equivalent ways to play the game that all result in the same value for how well each of the players does. But it doesn't lend you much insight into how players would actually figure out how to play those games for themselves. So the nice things about multiplicative weights were that all we did was we had Alice and Bob play multiplicative weights against each other, and then what that did was it converged to distributions on strategies that are close to best responses. So what we did was we found something that was close to the min-max strategies just by using multiplicative weights and the guarantees we had for it as a black box. So multiplicative weights is a really powerful idea. And today what we're going to do is we're going to study further applications of it. So today we'll all be about applications of multiplicative weights. So multiplicative weights is something which has really been rediscovered many times, and not all of the times it was rediscovered was it clear that what was going on underneath it was really just this game about competing with the best expert. So what I'm going to do is first we're going to talk about an application that's a little bit different than the things we've been talking about so far. It's from something called computational learning theory. So let me explain the setup of some of these types of questions. And then I'll tell you how exactly multiplicative weights fits in in this. But first, what I want to do is we're working up towards something which is called Anaboost. Anaboost is something which was invented by Freund and Shapiri, for which they actually won a Girdle Prize, so pretty big deal, for the simple boosting algorithm that I'll describe later. But in order to really describe the setting for Anaboost, the first thing I need to do is tell you a little bit about computational learning theory. So let me introduce some of the basic notions. This will be the framework that we study today. So some basic notions from what's called pack learning, which is a framework that was introduced by Les Valiant about 30 years ago. In fact, there are awards all over the types of things we're talking about today. So Les Valiant actually won the Turing Award a few years ago, in large part due to things like some of his work on pack learning, as well as his work on computational complexity. Now, pack learning, in fact, the best way to talk about what it is is first tell you what pack learning stands for. So pack learning stands for probably, approximately, correct. So not a very high goal here. Our goal is just we're probably going to get something that you know, is approximately correct. But it'll be a natural framework for studying learning problems. So you know the setting for pack learning, I need to introduce a few more definitions before we can really see what exactly we're referring to when we talk about things being probably approximately correct. 
But the basic setting in computational learning theory is that we have some concept class. This is some set of functions, you know, which I'll use to denote H. These are some set of functions which themselves go from our domain X. So these are the examples that we see all come from this domain. And all we're trying to do is we're trying to label them as either plus one or minus one. So you can think about, for example, things like spam detection. You might have some domain which is really just one of the words in different emails. And now what you want to do is you want to come up with some function that's actually going to take whatever that example is and spit out one for whether it's spam and minus one if it's not spam. So just to make sure we're on the same page, you know, some examples of things, important classes of important <coughs> concept classes, you can think about things like linear classifiers. These are things which are very, very powerful, are the basis for a lot of different learning algorithms, where you can think about the point x, for example, in this domain as actually being points in the plane. And all you're going to do for this particular function that labels things as being spam or not spam is you're going to label plus for everything on one side of the linear separator and minus for the things on the other side. So this is just some general notation for in pack learning. What you're given is there's some concept class H, which, is, which contains your idealized function, the function that really does classify email messages as to whether they're spam or not. One simple example is something like a linear classifier. But now what I can do is I can tell you what the goals of pack learning are. So in pack learning, what's going to happen is we're given labeled examples. So in our case, labeled examples were given with some point x1 along with some labeling of x1. All this is of some plus 1 or minus 1. And we're given n different points along with their labels which are themselves sampled from some distribution. And this function f is something which is in our concept class. So this is the setting for pack learning is all we're doing is we're given a bunch of labeled examples that come from some underlying distribution. We see that example along with how the target function that we want to compete with actually labels that function. And the goal in pack learning is just to be able to compete with this unknown function. So this is what's called strong learning. So let me define what that is, and then I'll take some questions about uh, what exactly we're trying to do. So the goal is really to design an algorithm that takes all of these examples and what it does is it outputs a hypothesis. Which itself is nothing more than some labeling function. It labels the examples from our domain as either being plus one or minus one. But now, this is where the probably approximately correct fits in, is what do we want out of this hypothesis? So we want that it's probably in the sense that with probability, at least 1 minus delta, it satisfies, it has low error. So that in future points taken from this distribution, the probability that it gets the wrong label compared to this target function is itself at most epsilon. So this definition is always a little bit of a mouthful the first time you see it, but just to make sure you guys are parsing it correctly. So pack learning stands for probably approximately correct. What parameter in here governs the probability? Where does the probability fit in? Exactly. So probably refers to the fact that with probability at least 1 minus delta. That randomness comes from the fact that our examples came from some distribution. We have to budget for the fact that maybe we got super unlucky and we didn't actually get a nice set of examples. What if, for example, in this linear class bar, we kept trying to get new samples from our distribution, but we kept getting the same point over and over again? There's nothing we could really say. So probably, you know, we're allowing ourselves some failure probability. And now the approximately correct refers to the epsilon, right? 
because it's saying probably, with probability at least one minus delta, we get something whose error is at most epsilon on future training points. Yeah? Yeah, so what's D? What is, so for some distribution, so distribution, this distribution D is something hidden underneath that governs how we measure our error. Because, for example, that could be the distribution on emails that we actually see. And we want that on future emails we see, that we only have at most an epsilon chance of getting the wrong answer. So this is called strong learning because what your goal really is, and I haven't pulled in all of the different quantifiers in here, is you want to be able to drive this error down small. As you take more and more examples, you want to drive the failure probability down to zero, and you want to drive your error down to zero too. Yeah. What is the quantifier on the last expression? Are we saying that holds for every x in the domain? x sampled from d. We want that uh, when we measure how often we get the wrong answer, that only an epsilon weight in the distribution has the wrong answer. Actually, there's only a little subtle here because we're also taking the probability over the set of samples we are trained on in the first place. Yeah, those come from D though. So we want that our algorithm with probability, you know, our algorithm takes some samples, x1 to xm, which come from this distribution D. And our algorithm should have the property that with probability at least one minus delta, what it spits out is the hypothesis has low error. So this quantity right here is actually, we're going to note this by uh, error of h on d. So this is just measuring how often we get the wrong answer for this hypothesis h, how often we end up getting the wrong label compared to our goal target function, measured with respect to what the underlying distribution we care about actually is. Yep. Do we require h to come from the constant cost? So that's an excellent question. So there are uh, tons of variants of this. When you rely, when you require h to come from the concept class, it's called proper learning. When you don't, it's called improper learning. I won't actually be concerned with the difference. And what we're going to be doing is we're not actually going to be uh, giving particular algorithm for this. What we're going to be doing is this will be, I'll introduce a concept called weak learning. That's going to be much easier. And the main content is we're going to show that ideas from multiplicative weights can be used to turn weak learners into strong learners. So we'll have some time to actually sit and think about this definition. But let me instead tell you, um, you know, what weak learning is in contrast to this. So are there any other questions about this? It's a little bit of a mouthful the first time you see it. But we'll have some time to fully digest it as we go on. Yep. What does probability define the over? The probability one might not go there. This is over the samples we're given. So our algorithm A, what it does is it's actually given delta and epsilon, which are some target parameters for you know, how good it's supposed to be. And then it computes an M, gets that many samples from the distribution. And the algorithm then takes those labeled examples and spits out some hypotheses. So one simple setting which you can think about just for you know, as a toy example, Imagine that we were actually given some distribution on points in the plane, and all of them really were labeled according to some linear classifier that actually says everything above it is plus, everything below it is minus. So what our algorithm could do is it could take a bunch of samples from the distribution, and it could find any separating hyperplane where all the pluses are on one side and all the minuses are on the other, and it would spit out that hypothesis. It's sort of a classic fact in learning theory that that actually is good and that that really would have low error without too many examples being seen. So that's the goal. Are there any other questions about this? Let me define what weak learning is, but, uh, and then I'll tell you exactly what we want to study. So in a lot of settings, so what I claim is that in many settings, It's often easier to get what's called the weak classifier. Instead of epsilon being something that's very small, what we might instead want is that the error that we're able to achieve is just a little bit better than a half. So let's say it's at most a half minus eta. For this eta, we can think about it as some sort of advantage 
over random guessing. See, what I claim is that in this type of pack learning setting, it's always trivial to get error a half, right? So why is it always trivial to get error a half? Randomly Just randomly guess, right? I don't even have to worry about what that family of hypotheses was in the first place. All I do is I just ignore the examples. I cover my eyes, and every new example you see, I flip a coin, whether it's plus one or minus one. Now, the important thing is that in some cases, it's easy to beat random guessing just by a little bit. So if you think about something like spam detection, right? So you're given a bunch of emails, and you want some function that's going to take in the description of the email and spit out a one if it's spam or a minus one if it's not spam. So what would be a good sort of rule of thumb that gets you a little bit better than random guessing? Yep. Is this Nigerian prince? Yeah, exactly. Nigerian prince or any other ones? Viagra. Viagra. I guess this is the part in the lecture where it's an excuse to yell out profanities. So I'll allow one more, and then I think things might get off the rails. Free offer. Free offer. Oh, that was such a tame last one. <laughs> so in any case, this is, so you should think about this at least in the language of things like, you know, supervised learning is this goal, right? Or uh, pack learning is this goal. Where our goal, you know, you don't have to worry about all of the quantifiers. The goal is just to have an algorithm that takes a bunch of examples and spits out something that actually has low error. And a lot of settings, it's easier to not think about this error as being really, really tiny, something that you can get to go to zero. What if instead you think about just this weak classification task where your goal is just to be able to do a little bit better than flipping a coin and ignoring it? So the amazing thing about Adaboost, which is, we're going to see is going to rely on a lot of ideas that we developed from things like multiplicative weights, is actually that weak classification and, and weak learning and strong learning are not actually all that different. So what we're going to show today is we're going to show that actually we can build up from weak learners. We can get strong learning directly from it. Wait a second, are you sure that that is the actual right definition you want for weak learning for Adaboost? Because that sounds too weak. Uh, Saying only error in the sense that... I haven't fully defined what I need from the weak learning. Okay. Let me tell you slightly a little bit what Michael is getting at, is that actually what we're going to assume is that for every distribution D that you put on the examples, you can tell me some <coughs> rule of thumb that beats random guessing. If you can do that, we're actually going to be able to build up strong learning. So that's where the multiplicative weights fits in, is that rules of thumb are going to be things which you know, we're going to be able to play with the distribution and actually put more and more mass on the things that we're not getting right. And that's exactly how we're going to build this connection between them. So that might not be completely clear yet, but let me actually formalize a little bit of this. Let me first define what Adaboost is. <coughs> And then we'll prove some theorems about it, and we'll see how it actually meets this goal of actually being able to take weak learners and turn them into strong learners. So let me define what Adaboost is. It's a beautiful algorithm which has all sorts of practical applications. This is due to Freund and Shapiri. <coughs> So the idea is the following. Adaboost is going to be given some labeled examples. And as usual, we're going to note them by x1, f of x1, all the way up to xm, f of xm. So these are our labeled examples. And what Adaboost is going to do is it's going to slowly change the distribution until it gets a good classifier. So initially, all it's going to do is it's going to set its initial distribution V1 to be uniform on the M examples. And here's what it's going to do. So it's going to have T rounds, so for 1 to T. 
first thing it's going to do is it's going to start off with the uniform distribution, and it's going to find some weak learner for which I'll call HT, so that's the hypothesis it finds, on this distribution DT it started off with. And let's say that it has error epsilon t. So all it's going to do is it starts off in the first round, takes the uniform distribution on the examples it's seen so far, and it asks for a rule of thumb for those examples, which beats 50-50 guessing. Right? So it starts off from this <coughs> Uh, hypothesis HT that it's found H1 initially. And let me introduce one parameter. It's going to set alpha T, and this is where a bit of the magic is going to happen, equal to some function of the error. This alpha T should really be interpreted as a weight for how good that hypothesis is at getting low error. So ultimately what it does is it then upweights the examples that it gets wrong. So it creates a new distribution, dt plus 1, which how much mass it assigns to the point x is going to be how much ever the old mass was times, well, what else are you going to do but some exponential weight. So all it's going to do is it's going to take ht of x times f of x. So this thing right here is going to be, this overall thing is plus 1 in the exponent when you've gotten the wrong label and these two values disagree. And otherwise, it's going to give you minus 1 in the exponent. And it'll be multiplied all by this weight. And ultimately, this isn't the distribution. So what you have to do is you have to renormalize it by some zt. Right? So this is all it's going to do, is it's going to keep changing the distribution. It starts off with a uniform distribution. It outputs some weak learner that it's found. And on all of the examples which that weak learner gets wrong, it upweights the distribution of those points, and it downweights the distribution on the points it really did get right. And at the end of the day, the thing that it's actually going to do is it's going to output some weighted majority of the hypotheses it's found so far. So it's going to take the sine function of this weighted sum of these individual classifiers. Yep. Did you say epsilon t was the error over dt? Yeah, exactly. So the error is in reference to dt. Exactly. So that's whatever error it gets on dt. But this is the idea, is we're slowly changing the distribution. At the end of the day, after t rounds, all we're going to do is we're going to take a weighted majority vote of the different classifiers we've created. And that, lo and behold, will actually work very well on our training examples. Yeah? Does anything special happen when dt is exponential damage? <sighs> like, it looks like once one of them is, then everything else should be positive dt. Yeah, so I mean, so the thing is, this merits a little further discussion. Because right now, this actually doesn't sound like it's along the lines of things we're talking about. See, what's important is that the original d1 is uniform on all of the points. So here, the goal is actually initially just to come up with a classifier h of x that works on our training set. So that strikes it as a little bit strange, but what's powerful about this is that because it doesn't take too many rounds, it actually creates something that's not too complex. And when it works well on the training examples, it actually does work well going forward. But the way that we're actually going to study this is forgetting about pack learning for the moment we're just going to study this algorithm and show that it very quickly converges to something with low empirical error on the original examples we were given. So that's actually what our goal is. So the reason it's related to multiplicative weights is pretty clear because it's doing multiplicative weights on the distribution. But it's a pretty amazing fact, actually. It's surprising that this is true. So the first person to show this is called a boosting result, because you're boosting weak classifiers into strong ones. Freund was the first one to show it. It was actually not even clear that boosting was possible to begin with. And this is the sort of vast simplification of some of those results. It's actually interesting looking back and seeing uh, the original boosting papers because they're way more complicated than what we're about to prove. So are there any questions about the description of Ada boost? Yeah? I just wanted to make sure here, um, the labeled examples, the M of them, those yeah. are the experts. 
Uh, so, oh, as in, what's the connection between like, this and that? It does correspond to experts. In. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let me say a little bit more about what the connection is to duality theory and zero-sum games in a little bit. So the first thing I want to do is I want to state the theorem about how well this does. We're actually going to give a direct proof for this because it'll be slightly better than we could do as a black box of multiplicative weights, but then I'll address your question. It's also worth noting that this is based on a very slightly different variant of multiplicative weights in one game, because we said to multiply by something like one plus, um, like exactly. we said to multiply by yeah. one plus something, here we said to multiply by e to the something, but basically e to the x and one plus x are close to each other for small x anyway, so it pretty much doesn't matter. Yes. Is it basically the same as far as So are there any other questions about added boost? That everyone understands what added boost is? Very simple algorithm. Let me tell you a theorem about it, if not. So here's the theorem that we're going to prove. So let me introduce just a slight piece of notation. I'm going to let eta t be <coughs> Just a different way of thinking about the error, epsilon t. I'll think about it as the advantage that that gets over random guessing. Right? So I'm just defining a to t to be half minus epsilon t, because that will be the more convenient way to state the theorem. <coughs> but what we're going to prove is we're going to prove that ultimately the error of this aggregate hypothesis that we spit out on our original distribution P1, which was the uniform distribution on the examples right, that we started off with, that this error actually goes down exponentially. So it's e to the minus sum t from 1 to t of a to t squared. So as long as you can always generate rules of thumb that beat random guessing by a little bit, then you don't have to go through many steps of add a boost to actually come up with something that achieves very small error on the original thing to begin with. So that's a theorem we want to prove. In fact, what's kind of cool about this, and this was the difference between this version of boosting versus the earlier ones, is that the earlier ones needed some lower bound eta on all of the different eta t's you see, and they only got that going on in the exponent. But in this example, actually, when you do get a weak classifier that does way better than your naive bound, you actually immediately see that the error goes down by even more because of it. Is there a question? Wait, doesn't the weight seem that our actual real distribution is uniform? So, well, what I'm saying is let's hold off on what this implies in terms of actually getting a low error on the true distribution to begin with. I'm just talking about it as error of h on b1. Later, I'll state the results about how they translate the low error on the original distribution b1. But for now, let's just think about this as an interesting goal, because it's not clear that even on a set of examples that you can build up some aggregate classifier from these simple ones that actually does very well on those. Yeah? How does this fail if the class are just the same? If every good player is exactly the same? Oh, uh, the distribution is changing. So the new classifier you get, so if you take the classifier from the first one, right? And then what you, if that wasn't perfect and classify everything correctly, then slowly you're increasing the weights, actually you're multiplicatively increasing the weight on the things you've gotten wrong. So maybe H1, the next, you know, the, the first weak learning you found, still works in that new distribution, but if it, you know, it can't keep working forever, uh, if it's making any errors, because I'm putting more and more weight on the things that's getting wrong. So changing the distribution is often going to force you to change what the class bar is that achieves low error. Okay, so this is a silly point, but your theorem statement does assume that all of the a to t are greater than or equal to zero. So if you give something that returns that has a yes, yes, if your thing returns something that's useless, you will not make progress. Yes. All right. Any other? Does this make sense now? Yep. All right. Any other questions about this? It's a really cool theorem. The proof is very short. Do a proof here. It's not going to be too long at all. 
So here's the idea. Well, first we need to do a little bit of algebra and see what we're working with. Well, expanding the distribution, dt plus 1, the thing that we get at the end of the day, what we're going to end up with is what I claim is that this dt plus 1 on some example xi that we've seen, well, all it is is it's the product of a bunch of terms because, after all, we're making multiplicative changes. So certainly we get the contribution from d1 of xi. That's true. And now we're going to get all of the other terms in here. So we'll get an e to the minus alpha 1 h1 of x, this normalizing constant z1. And we're going to go all the way out to the last multiplicative update that we do, which is nothing more than the same thing, but with capital T in the exponent instead. And we have this new normalizing factor, zt. Right? So this is just literally writing out what the distribution we get at the end of the day is. So now what I claim is that the main work is actually just going to come in one inequality. So if we, at the end of the day, care about what our error of our hypothesis H is on the original distribution, the uniform distribution on the examples, well, let me write that out. That's nothing more than the sum over all of the examples of an indicator function of if f of xi is not equal to h of xi. Now, the important thing here is all in this one inequality, because that's what makes everything work, is that we can upper bound this instead by some, you know, this is a really non-smooth function, but we can upper bound it by a smooth function instead, which is e to the minus f of xi times sum over t of alpha t h t of xi. So can anyone tell me how exactly I did that? So what, why is that step true? This takes a little bit of parsing here because, see, remember that this term right here, well, you know, it looks like f of xi times what happens inside the sine function, which is how we actually get our aggregate hypothesis at the end of the day, right? So can anyone give me some intuition for why this inequality holds? This is where the main meat is going on. Are we just bounding the step function by the exponential yeah, function? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So not that hard, actually. But you know, the point is, when these two things are different signs, then we know that this term right here times this term is actually going to give us something that <coughs> is negative. And then times the extra minus one out front, we get something that's positive. So we're just bounding the fact that this is e to some positive that might be barely, barely above 0. But that's fine, because it's still an upper bound on 1. And in the other places, it's something non-negative, even though what it's upper bounding is 0. So we're taking the step function, we're approximating it by something smoother. This is actually the main workhorse that was going on underneath in our proof of multiplicative weights was the same type of approximation but through the potential function that we use. So at the end of the day, what this is actually now, this term is actually equal to, is it's the same thing as the sum from 1 to m of dt plus 1 of xi times the product of the zt's from 1 to t. Because lo and behold, part of it is actually just staring us right in the face right here. Right? So at the end of the day, what I claim is that the entire proof boils down to one elementary piece that we're going to prove along the way, which is going to finish the proof, is that each of these ZTs we can show is at most e to the minus 2 eta t squared. And then this would complete the proof, right? So why would this claim plus this error bound finish the proof at the end of the day? It's just, it's literal. It's just... Anyone help me out? So if we have this claim, and from this expression, I claim we'd be done with the theorem. Yeah? Well, if you take the part 
product of the ZTs, you get uh, the exponent you want. Yes. And then the last thing I'm looking for is just that dt plus 1 is a distribution. That's it. Right? So this would actually be the end of the proof. And the entire thing rests on just proving this one claim that these normalizing factors are not themselves too big. So let's prove that part. Promise it's a simple claim. <laughs> so let's prove this one claim and then we'll be done with this theorem. So let's write out what ZT is, right? All I did was I told you it was some uh, normalizing constant. But uh, let's write out explicitly what this normalizing constant is. So all it is is the sum over all of the examples of the amount that the numerator puts on that example. So it's dt of xi times itself this e to the minus alpha t ht of xi times f of xi, right? That's exactly what the normalizing <coughs> factor should be here in order to make this overall left-hand side a distribution. So I'm just writing out what the actual normalizing function is. But now, in fact, let me do one simple trick, which the rest of it is going to fall out immediately from that. So what I claim is that this quantity is equal to e to the minus alpha t times the sum over all of the correct xi's of dt of xi plus e to the alpha t times the sum over the incorrect xi's. <coughs> Because this term right here is either, you know, inside is either plus one or minus one. So I'm just breaking it up into these two pieces. So who can tell me what this actually works out to? So what's, we have the notation already to write down exactly what this is. What is this term? One half plus eta. One half plus eta, yep. The other thing, I'm going to write it out slightly differently, is that this term is the same thing as one minus epsilon t. This term right here is the same thing as epsilon t. That's the way that we defined epsilon t, was epsilon t was the weighted error of ht on this distribution dt. So it's the total weight on the points which it gets wrong. Right? So now we're actually in great shape because, you know, after all, we had this magical alpha t term that we set in this kind of weird way. But why we set alpha t is just going to fall out exactly from this expression. So the point is that, you know, how did we set alpha t was equal to half log 1 minus epsilon t over epsilon t. And what this implies then is that zt, well, it's actually exactly what alpha t should be to balance these two expressions, right? When I pull the half up here and I take the square root inside of 1 minus epsilon t over epsilon t, then lo and behold, this term right here, I'm going to cancel one of the root epsilon t's, and then I'm going to get exactly the same contribution over here. So at the end of the day, what this equals for this choice of alpha t is nothing more than the balancing between these two different terms. That's exactly how we set it for boosting. And now if you play with what eta t is in order to actually get the expression we want, well, this thing is two times half minus eta t times half plus eta t, which now is square root of one minus four eta t squared. So we're almost done. After all, we just need to massage it into that expression. And this term right here is now, at most, e to the minus 
4 eta t squared, all to the 1 half power, and I get this minus 2 eta t squared. Right? Just using the standard approximation that 1 minus x is at most e to the minus x. And that's it. That implies the claim, which now actually finishes the proof of the overall theorem, because all we have to do is we say that dt plus 1 is a distribution. So we can actually bound this overall error by just the product of the different zt's, which is exactly this e to the minus sum eta ti squared in here. I think perhaps I forgot a the two. two. Is there a question? So does this make sense? This is actually the full proof of Adaboost now. So I promised you it is actually pretty simple. But the idea is actually beautiful because it's the same thing as multiplicative weights. Whenever you have the power to be able to answer quick rules of thumb, like you give me a distribution on examples, and I can produce a weak classifier, that's actually a very strong guarantee in the sense that that actually, through boosting, can give you a linear classifier that's a weighted average that actually does very well on your training set. So this was great. This was one of the big open questions at the time in computational learning theory, and it follows just from multiplicative weights, types of arguments. So are there any questions about this? Yeah? So it seems like in the loop where you're doing the t to 1 to t, um, each step you have to get a new weak learner, mm -hmm. but the uh, distribution is becoming closer and closer to some true loop distribution, um, and it's becoming a little bit, it's going to become harder and harder to learn a weak learner each step, it seems like. There's no guarantee that it's converging to a true distribution. Yeah. Um, it's actually converging, it's actually going away from the distribution that I already cared about. See, initially, the thing right. that I care about is this uniform distribution on the examples. Right. And what's going on is that actually I'm weighting the things that I haven't gotten right that much. So, yeah. Sorry. Uh, what, what I, yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, but, but that means that shouldn't the weak classifier learners be harder and harder to get it over time? Because like you're looking at residual, basically. Um, right. So I mean, the semantics of the theorem, at least, are there's no promise about how you could find such weak learners. Because after all, some problems that computational learning theory tries to solve are rather challenging. But what this is saying is that actually something like strong learning, it suffices to do weak learning for all of the distributions you encounter in this boosting procedure. So what this is used as sometimes is it's used in practice as a way to combine weaker classifiers to get a, an overall thing that actually is better as right. a result. I guess I'm wondering how hard is it to find these weak learners in practice? That depends on the application. Okay. So I think in the original paper, the way they described the setup for these types of problems was, you know, imagine you had, you wanted to create a, a way to bet on horses, and you had some experts who every time you gave them a configuration of, you know, this is the race and these are the types of horses, it would give you some rule of thumb and actually pick out a horse that has some better chance of winning. Statistically, you know, and they would give you some rule like, well, the reason I picked that horse was because it had won six in a row. Or the reason I picked it was because it does well in you know, the mutter or something. Right? But what they were trying to tie this to is that actually if you can get all of, if you can always have someone who can answer those weak classification questions for you, then you can actually build it into something that actually does work over the entire thing. So are there, I saw some other hands. Were there other questions about this? This theorem makes sense? So uh, I do want to tell you, but you know, since this is not a computational learning theory class, I can't go too far into it. Let me at least briefly answer this other question, which I've been sweeping under the rug. And I'm only going to answer it at a high level. So what about things like the error of the overall hypothesis on the original distribution of heat? After all, what you're doing here is you're taking a bunch of examples from some underlying distribution D. Those give you the x1 through xm. And then what you're doing is you're building up a classifier that actually works on all of your data that you have access to. But what you really care about is not how well it does on the data you have access to, but how well it does going forward. So actually, the intuition here is that <coughs> and this is all I'm going to tell you about it, is just the intuition, is the intuition is that, well, if we have not too many 
rounds of boosting. Well, what that means is that the h of x that we construct at the end of the day does not get too complicated. And let me tell you what that implies to a theorem. But see, the point though is that this goal of getting low error on D1 is itself a trivial problem. You know, what, what would do the trick? What H would end up having low error on the training examples we have access to? Yep. Return the training labels. Just return the training labels, right? That's not a very, uh, that's not a short description for what that class bar is. But the point is that actually in this boosting procedure, if you have the guarantee that each one of your weak learners is itself not too complicated a function, then what you're getting for this boosting procedure is something that also isn't too complicated because you're not doing too many rounds. And then what you can prove is you can prove bounds on how well, how small error HD is. And what Freud and Shapiro show is that the error that you get on the true set is bounded by your training error, so the error on your examples you've seen, plus some additive term here that itself depends on how many rounds you've seen, how many examples you've seen, and something else called the VC dimension, which is a measure of how complex these intermediate hypotheses you see along the way are. So I'm not going to define what VC dimension is, but it turns out that once you can do boosting, you can actually get interesting error guarantees for how well you do going forward. So that's just the taste of where this fits in, into the overall picture. But the important thing is really just the statement of the theorem for at a boost. And what's going on under the hood is that you're doing the same type of thing as what was going on within zero-sum games, that the way that you were getting Alice to converge to a good strategy was that you were playing her against Bob, who's also running multiplicative weights. So what you're doing here is you're getting overall a good classifier by creating harder and harder distributions for the classifiers you've seen so far, until what you get at the end of the day is actually something that works. So are there any questions about this? Now in this case, only one of our players is multiplicative weights. And that's the player that we're actually throwing away. And yes. The player we're keeping is its opponent. Yes, exactly. So it's slightly different than that, but it's actually the same spirit. Yep. So I'm just curious. The VC dimension is for the aggregate classifier? No, the VC dimension is for all of the intermediate hypotheses. So if you have some measure that, you know, after all, I'm assembling them, I'm assembling some weak classifiers in here. And I'm saying that as long as you're taking things that are simple and doing not too many rounds, Actually, the fact that you have low error on your training set is actually indicative of it having low error going forward. But that's the main point behind this. All right, so that's actually, I thought, a fairly different type of application. See, multiplicative weights comes up not only in things like zero-sum games, but it also comes up in a lot of computational learning theory through this type of framework. And what I thought I'd do for the end is actually tell you one other application of multiplicative weights. This will be at a more high level, but uh, we don't have time to go into all of the different applications, so I'll do one last one before we move on to semi-definite programs on Wednesday. So if there are any other questions about Adaboos, speak now or forever hold your peace until we give you peace set questions on it. What is it called, Adaboos? Ah, adaptive boosting. Oh. So the original versions of boosting actually didn't choose the alpha t's as a function of how well the error was. So they chose a uniform distribution on the different class bars you see, and actually weighting them based on how well they did on the distribution they were handed turned out to be the difference that actually made these things very, very practical. Yep? Were you going to talk about how well it will do on like the actual original distribution as opposed to the I just stated that theorem, and that's it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we don't have the time to go into the tools for like VC dimension and stuff, but that's the main point, is that you can get guarantees like that. Yeah. If you just have a bunch of weak learners, which were, uh, we've looked at D1, uh -huh. so you're not by kind of distribution, you yep. go along, can you still aggregate in some way to get Well, see problem? there, that would go back to the, uh, the question the guy behind you asked was, what would prevent you from just answering the same weak learner every time? So here, multiplicative weights is a mechanism for us to get at the part of the distribution that we haven't gotten right so far. 
All right. So I will give you one other application. This will be a little bit more at a high level, but I want to do this too just because it connects back to a lot of the other things we've seen. Some of the things we've covered, we've covered max flows in a lot of detail. We've covered multiplicative weights and applications for zero sum games. Let me actually connect all of these things together and show you the fact that they're actually very related concepts. So, what I want to do for the uh, remainder is I want to give another quick application. I'm not going to flesh this out completely, but another application back to things we've talked about is the flows. So if you remember our favorite max flow problem, there's a way to write this as a linear program. In fact, let me do something that's a little bit silly. Let me write it as an exponentially large linear program. That's one of the things that we first did, was we can think about it as we can look at all of the paths between S and T in some graph. And we can try and maximize the flow along all of these paths, but subject to some constraints, right? So what are the constraints we have for flows? Conservation. Conservation, yep. So I'm writing this out in the path uh, form. So actually, conservation will automatically be satisfied, but there's one other constraint that I care about. Yep. Edge capacities. Edge capacities. So what I can do is I can look at all the paths that contain E. And I can have the constraints that, let's say, uh, they send at most one unit of flow. So let me work in the uncapacitated setting where all the edges are capacity one to keep things as simple as possible to explain where multiplicative weights fits into some of the language that we've already talked about. We need that all of these flow values are non-negative, and we need this conservation of holds for all of the different edges. So we talked about at length in earlier parts of the course were things like duality. So if you take the dual to this linear program, what you're going to end up getting is you're looking to assign lengths to the different edges in such a way that the sum of the lengths along every path is at least one for every source to sync path. And also that these lengths are themselves non-negative, right? So this is like a fractional relaxation of min cut. Because min cut would correspond to what type of solution for this dual? Integer. Integer, yep. And it would just have ones along the edges that are actually crossing the cut. So this is what we talked about for a long time, was just things like max flow. But now what I claim is that we can actually interpret this problem, this primal <laughs> and this dual, itself as a zero-sum game. And we can ask, what happens when we play multiplicative weights on these types of games? So this happens a lot in optimization, that duality, you could cast it as a zero-sum game if you wanted to. And the fact that you can use multiplicative weights to converge to good strategies actually gives you interesting ways to solve these optimization problems we cared about to begin with. So let me let uh, gamma denote the optimal value, so the actual max flow. And what I want to do right now is I actually want to cast this problem as a zero-sum game instead. That way we can think about multiple weights. So let me instead write something that looks similar to this, but now is a game between two players. So we'll consider the following zero-sum game. So we're going to have two players. I'll call one the P player, P for primal. And all he's going to do is he's going to choose an ST path in the original graph. And we're going to have another player, the D player, D for dual. And what's he going to do? He's going to choose some edge. 
E. Okay. And what we're going to do is that ultimately the payoff to player D of these two strategies is just going to be one if the edge is in the path and zero otherwise. So this is a very natural game where one player is trying to find a way to get from a source to the sink, and the other player is actually trying to catch it in the act, right? And intuitively in this graph, if there's a large max flow, it's something that makes it better for the P player because there are more paths you can try and evade the strategy on. And if there's a small min cut, then it makes it better for the D player. So this player, this game is well defined. Now, one of the interesting things about this is that I claim I would have a really bad time if I tried to write down a payoff matrix. Why? Exponential size. It's exponentially large, right? The P player has exponentially many strategies, and the D player does not, one for each edge, so that's not too bad. But actually, even though this payoff matrix is exponentially large, you can get a lot of mileage. In fact, you can get some of the most mileage out of playing zero-sum games on games like that, because it allows me to find good solutions to this game without actually even writing down the entire description of the matrix, which would already be prohibitively large. So what I claim is the following, and I'll just assert this, because that's not the main part. What I'll do is I'll let uh, nu be the optimal value to d of the game. So if they play this zero-sum game, we already know that there are notions of min-max, right? that there's the game value. And let me just let nu denote whatever that is. I certainly don't want to compute that using a linear program because I'd have to write down the payoff matrix to begin with, and that would be probably pretty bad. But what I claim is that these two are very related <coughs> quantities. That the optimal value of the game, can anyone guess what it is in terms of gamma? Yeah. Anyone have any intuition for this? <coughs> Ah, uh, almost. One over, right? The larger the max flow, the better it is for the P player. New is the payoff to D. So these are actually the same. So if this actually doesn't look obvious, what I'll do is I'll actually prove this, and then I'll, this is the simple claim, but then I'll tell you what multiple of ways fits in. So let me actually prove this claim. If, it looks counterintuitive to people. Actually, I'm kind of curious. How many people does this look counterintuitive to? I see a higher raise of hands. It looks surprising. How many people are not surprised? Wait, how Flight? is gamma defined here? Is it what? when you assign capacities of one? Yes, okay. yes. So to keep things simple, I could do all of these things with capacitated graphs. But let me keep things as simple as possible because we did flows a while ago. Let's treat it as unit capacities for everything. Then gamma is just the max flow. And nu is just whatever the game value is for this game. So let me actually prove this claim for you, if it looks surprising. So here's how the proof goes. Well, let's start with an optimal solution. to the dual, right? At the end of the day, this optimal solution of the dual is a length assignment for the different edges. Anyone have any ideas for how we should use that to construct a good strategy for the D player? Uh, mm. Yep. Uh, you just use, uh, like, in this case, L as your probability distribution. Yep, or and just renormalize. Normalize. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So all we're going to do is we're going to choose an edge E with probability the length of the edge divided by the sum total of all of the lengths of the edges. This is nothing more than L of E over gamma, right? 
because gamma is the actual optimal value for this PB pair, for the primal and dual LPs. So why does this mean now that the P player has no good response to the strategy? If I play this strategy, what's the best the P player could do to try and evade? Yep. Choose a random path. So even, yeah, uh, so the point is that for, so this constraint right here that the sum of the L's along any path from S to T is at least one, means that for every path from S to T, the sum of the probabilities, which is the chance that we'll catch him on that path, is at least uh, one over gamma in that case, right? So the point is by construction, mm -hmm. for every path P in P of S T, we have that the sum of the probability that D chooses E is itself at least, well, one over gamma, because we had that the sum of the lengths was at least one to begin with, and we've now divided by gamma. So that tells you immediately that actually with this strategy, the optimal solution to the dual, we can immediately construct a good solution for the D player that actually gets at least this value one over gamma. The other converse direction is actually the same. So, you know, conversely, what we can do is we can take an optimal solution to P, right? And what we can do is that gives us a unit flow, which we can define as the actual flow we found in the graph divided by this optimal value gamma. That unit flow itself is a distribution on S to T paths, which that means the chance that, um, that he catches us is actually at most and the total flow on every edge was at most one. Now we've scaled it down by gamma. That means this new unit flow we've constructed puts at most one over gamma on each of the different edges. So what that means then is he has at most a one over gamma chance of catching us because each one of those edges he picks only has that chance of us actually choosing the S to T path. So that is actually... I'll leave it just there. <laughs> this is roughly what it goes. You can fill in the rest of the details. But this is what the relationship is between this primal dual pair and actually this zero sum game that captures what's actually going on. But what I want to tell you now is how you can actually plug in multiplicative weights into this thing. So let me describe a multiplicative weights algorithm and then I'll assert what it's actually doing, which this is the main point. So imagine we have this zero-sum game. We can try the same thing. So we've taken a max flow problem, interpreted it as a zero-sum game, and now we can use multiplicative weights on that zero-sum game. So what happens when we do? Let me describe this algorithm. So all we're going to do is for a bunch of different time steps for some t to be named later, what we're going to do is we're going to play the role of the d player. We're going to use multiplicative weights to choose his strategy. So in this case, some distribution wt on the edges. So this is how the d player chooses what he's going to do. And then what we're going to do is we're going to let the P player best respond. So we're going to let PT be the best response to these probabilities WT. So to put it another way, what is the P player's best response? So once the D player has chosen his weights for how he's going to choose the different edges, what's the P player's best response for not getting caught? Shortest path. Exactly. Shortest path according to the probabilities, right? So all this PT is, is in itself, is anything that's actually an argmin over 
all of the s to t halves of the total weight <laughs> along the edges in p, right? So that's all we're going to do is we keep playing multiplicative weights on the d player and allowing the p player to best respond. But the amazing thing, or maybe it shouldn't be that surprising, so what we're going to do is now we can set a reward vector, which is going to fit back into the algorithm. So, you know, we just have these two play against each other, wt against p. And what's going to happen is this reward vector is itself just going to be, well, the natural payoff. So one, if the edge the d player chooses is actually in this path pt, and zero otherwise, and we feed this reward vector back into multiplicative weights. So the important thing about this is the following lemma, which is where all of it happens. So let me let f be the flow that we get that routes m of t units of flow on each of these paths. So we have that the p player finds all of these different paths. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a flow, which is maximum, which you know just by evenly splitting that flow along all of the different paths. Now, this is definitely a flow of value gamma, because it sends this many units of flow on each of these paths. But the issue is it doesn't actually necessarily satisfy the capacity constraint. So the main lemma is that this flow actually routes at most 1 plus epsilon units on each edge. So see, this is the basic idea, is that the same way that when we use multiplicative weights that come up with good approximately min-max strategies for Alice and Bob in a zero-sum game, what we did was, at the end of the day, we had Alice choose an average of her strategies in the past that she's played, and that in turn would be her good min-max strategy. We're actually doing the same thing here, that we're actually allowing the P player that best respond to those D player is doing multiplicative weights. But at the end of the day, the P player is going to take the average of her strategies, and that in turn will be a good approximately optimal solution to the original optimization problem to begin with. So this is the way that you can actually build up algorithms for solving optimization problems through multiplicative weights as you're really interpreting them as zero-sum games, where you're going to take the average answer and show that that really is a good solution to the original problem to begin with. Because that flow f routes gamma units, that's optimal. And if we scale it down by 1 plus epsilon, then we really would get something that is a valid flow and is nearly optimal because it routes gamma over 1 plus epsilon. So this is the lemma that I'm going to prove for you. Does this make sense? Are there any questions about it? It's a pretty short proof for this lemma. Yep. So what epsilon again? So epsilon here. That's a very good question. Uh, so epsilon is going to end up with something that depends on t. So let me actually tell you what t is. But we're not going to see uh, why we set it this way until I prove this lemma for you. So as we play more and more rounds, we're converging to something that's better and better. And if we set t in this way, we're going to find something that actually does work. Yep. But we didn't know gamma. We're going to assume we know gamma for this. But uh, we can yeah, we can algorithm. search for it. This is just a thought experiment for this is way slower than the existing algorithms we have for flow. But this is designed as a thought experiment for why the two things actually have any relationship to each other, <coughs> is that you take the LP problem and you translate it to a zero-sum game. And then you say what multiplicative weights has to tell you about that zero-sum game and tie it back into the optimization problem you cared about to begin. No, this is a slightly different way of solving zero sum games with multiplicative weights than we talked about last class. Because here, one of the players is a best response player rather than a multiplicative weights player. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We're still just going to use the reward responses, anyways. But does this uh, make sense? Any questions about this? It's a short lemma. So let's do it.
All right. So this is the main one. Okay, so what else? Let's suppose not. And let's say that there's some edge that's actually violated. That if we were to take the average of these different paths we get to construct this flow, we got an edge that was way oversaturated, not just by a one plus epsilon factor, but by more. Yep. Is there a question? Oh, wait. So, wait. So f is not a valid flow, right? No. Okay. But it's close to, because if you scale it down by one plus epsilon, you would have something that's valid. That's what we're proving right now. So let me do this. This is pretty short. So what I claim is that then more than 1 plus epsilon t over gamma of the paths p1 through pt use e. Right? Why is that? Yep. Because of how we constructed. Yeah, just by definition, right? Each of these flow paths contains gamma over t units. So if we really did have that that was way too much, then we must have at least, if we have more than 1 plus epsilon on that edge, we must have at least this many paths using it. Now, the intuition is that, uh, so can anyone actually connect this to things like regret? This is the one leap of faith. You know, where does regret fit in here? So if we had an edge that was violated, can anyone think about how we would get a contradiction? And then we'll just push it forward. So the idea is that if there was such an edge, then it would be a way better response for the D player than what he's actually able to get. So that would mean he has a lot of regret because that one edge E, if he planed it in hindsight, he would have got some larger value, way larger than what he's actually encountered. So this was the entire point, is that then if the D player plays this edge, E, in hindsight, what would he get? Well, he'd get larger than 1 plus epsilon over gamma in average payoff, right? Because they're capital T paths, so that's exactly how much you would get at the end of the day. But now the point is that but each step he gets at most 1 over gamma in expectation. That's because the other player is choosing a best response. So they can always split their paths evenly among all of the different gamma paths and then only have that kind of chance of getting caught. So this is now a problem because he's off by some epsilon over gamma additively from what his average actual loss would be. And what you do at the end of the day is you set t so that the regret bound that you have for multiplicative weights would be too small to allow this kind of gap. That in turn proves the contradiction and implies that actually if you take f to be the average of all of these paths, what you get really does almost meet uh, capacity constraints. So this then violates the regret bound for our choice of t, and that's actually what produces a contradiction. So is there a question yet? Wait, I thought p chose their strategy to be optimal with respect to what the actually chose, not yes. necessarily Gary So however good that is, it's at least as good as what he would get if he chose uniformly over the gamma paths in his max flow. So what that means is when he's best responding to D, he ensures that D gets at most that value and expectation, and yet that would be much smaller additively than what he actually gets. Wait, doesn't he just choose it specifically against Right, the that, point is, right. we know that they never do better than 1 over gamma yeah. by the original claim. No, you only do better than 1 over gamma if the other per So it's possible for P to play a Let strategy. Let me rephrase it, right? 
look, the game value is actually one over gamma yes. for this. Now, if you think about it in that step in multiplicative way, it's what's going on is the D player is choosing some distribution on strategies, uh -huh. and then the P player goes. Uh -huh. By definition of the game value, the P player can always ensure that they lose at most one over gamma. So that's actually what they lose. Yes, but isn't the P player strategy uh, tailored to lose at most? So they could theoretically choose a strategy that loses at most one over gamma to all possible strategies. But wouldn't there possibly be a strategy which doesn't have this guarantee but does better against the specific strategy that they used? This is the abound on the expected loss that, uh, that the P player encounters in each time step. So again, we're defining the threat based on yeah. what the, on Look at the game they're playing, right? Based on uh, what the P player played in yeah. each step. I'll ask later. Yeah. OK, we'll take that offline then. But uh, so this is the uh, last thing we're going to do with multiplicative weights. So this was a lot of stuff covered in one lecture. But you know, the point is that actually multiplicative weights gets rediscovered in a lot of different settings. You know, Once we had it originally for the stock market prediction and best expert problem, it's something that, lo and behold, shows up and appears hidden underneath things like boosting and also how to build algorithms out of simpler ones. So if you think about what's going on here, we're actually figuring out how to play this large zero-sum game by only doing things like computing shortest paths along the way. You can actually do this not just for max flow, but even much more complex versions like multi-commodity flow problems, where what you're really doing is instead of solving them as a very large linear program, you can instead solve them through multiplicative weights. And it gets used all the time in optimization through this type of framework. So I'll leave it there, and let's take questions offline. But uh, otherwise, next time, we're going to be talking about semi-definite programs.